mother and my brothers. Talk about a terrific word for a day when we get to baptize a baby and receive new members into our congregation. Look around here, Ludicia, I can say in a few minutes, and I can say to all of you new members, here are your sisters and your brothers. Look around at these people from different parts of the world. We grew up in churches that, are, that look very much like ones you know, and ones that don't look anything like ones you know, who speak languages you understand and languages you don't even know exist, who live their faith in astounding and beautiful ways. Look around this room. You'll see people whom you know and people whom you haven't met yet. But today, they will be your new brothers and sisters in Christ. We get to say that today. And we can widen that circle, too. Look at Oscar Romero, one of the great saints of our faith, who fought tirelessly for the poor and oppressed in his home El Salvador, and who lost his life as part of that struggle for justice and peace. Or look at Mariam Buardi, one of two Palestinian women recently recognized as saints by the Roman Catholic Church. She worked in Bethlehem in the late 1800s and early 1900s, founding a religious community and she's remembered as living with extraordinary faith and love and also openness to others in a pluralistic environment. If that's not an example for our time, I don't know what is. So here are your sisters and your brothers. We can say that and we should say that. What a terrific word for today. It's this wonderful text. Until you read what comes before it. It may not look so wonderful then. Because it's actually a terribly difficult passage, all wrapped up with a conflict in Jesus' own family, with talk of divided kingdoms, with Jesus' instructions for how to rob a house, and with that scary bit about the unforgivable sin against the Holy Spirit. So it's not such a peachy text, after all. We are not going to solve all of that today. We will come back to this business about being Jesus' family, but first it helps to understand a little bit about what's behind this explosive passage, about the tinder that's already catching fire here in the third chapter of Mark's Gospel. Mark doesn't waste any time getting to the action. While Matthew and Luke are just kind of getting around to introducing John the Baptist by chapter 3, Mark already has people plotting to kill Jesus by that time. Jesus doesn't start quietly either. No sooner is he baptized than he's casting out a demon, healing a paralyzed man, and curing another on the Sabbath. All of it attracts attention, which is natural, but what everybody seems particularly concerned about is the brazenness with which Jesus is acting. I mean, there were other miracle workers and healers and exorcists around in Jesus' time. So it's not only those actions that are attracting all the attention, but it's the fact that this guy is acting with extraordinary authority, breaking well-established boundaries and norms wherever he goes. Where does that kind of authority come from? That's the question that's on everybody's mind. And there are only a handful of ways people have to answer it. The religious leaders have one answer. His authority comes from the devil, they say. These are the bigwigs we're talking about here. They're not the local rabbis from the synagogue down the street, but the scribes from Jerusalem. It's like the team of religion PhDs called in from the big university, called in to check out this disturbance up there in the boonies in Galilee. They listen to a few stories, and then they give their verdict. He has Beelzebul, they say in their best expert voices, and by the ruler of demons, he casts out demons. So Jesus doesn't fit their picture of how faith is supposed to work. 
He's not working within the established structures. He's not playing by the rules. He's not waiting for the necessary permits to arrive. And that's their way of explaining it. He's possessed by the devil. Jesus' family has another answer. He's crazy, they say. I don't know what gatherings are like in your family, but this one in Mark's gospel can make any look tame. <laughs> Jesus returns home to Nazareth, maybe to take a break from everything that's been going on, maybe to check in on his mother and his brothers. He heads home and the crowds follow him there. They're wanting to stay close to this charismatic healer and teacher. And while Jesus is out there in the town square tending to everybody, his family shows up and tries to restrain him. Let the poor man go, they say to the crowd. He's lost it. He's out of his mind. Just let him be. That's their way of dealing with this question of what's happened to him. I mean, the Jesus who grew up here and played nicely with other children and was learning to be a carpenter he wouldn't be causing all this fuss. Something's wrong with him. He's sick in the head. Just let him come home and rest. So in league with the devil, out of his mind, those are two explanations for what's going on. And Jesus has a third, that he's here to work against the powers that hold people captive, the powers of Satan in the language of Jesus' time. No one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man. Then indeed can the house be plundered. I really think those words are not meant to be practical instructions for breaking and entering. They're more meant to be words about what Jesus is really here to do. He's here to break every boundary, to free every captive, to tie up the strong men of fear and oppression and hatred. And we need to say just a word about that troubling bit that comes next. Those words about the eternal sin against the Holy Spirit. This passage has definitely haunted people over the years. Left them wondering just what that mysterious sin might be and if they or one of their loved ones are guilty of it. And I sure don't think it's ever been meant to do that. Jesus is here in a heated debate with people who see his authority coming from the devil. And I have to see his remark is meant for them, meant to wake them up, not to keep others awake for centuries to come, wondering if their sins are unforgivable. So Jesus is in the business here of breaking down walls and setting free and giving new life. And here's the thing, when you're out to do all that, you're going to attract quite a crowd around you. In the midst of all this heated talk and accusations flying around, somebody taps Jesus' shoulder with a message for him. Your mother and your brothers are waiting to see you, he says. And Jesus looks around at the crowd gathered around him, sees people there sitting at his feet. Maybe there were a few crooks, employees of Rome, men who made their living collecting taxes to pay for the occupation of their own country. Maybe there were a few prostitutes there, hearing something new in this talk of setting people free. Maybe there were a few poor fishermen, still reeking from the morning's catch. Maybe there were a few wealthy merchants whose ethics nobody ever really trusted. <coughs> your mother and your brothers are asking for you, someone says. And Jesus looks around at that crowd of ordinary, broken, blessed people. And he responds this way, here are my mother and my brothers. It's these folks, these who are seeking to do the will of God. They are my family. This is a terrible snub to Jesus' mother and brothers standing off at the edge of the crowd. A rough start to the family reunion for sure. And not, I think, Jesus' final words on how you're supposed to treat your family. But what an image this is of the church brothers and sisters to Christ and to one another. Because really, we don't exactly choose the family of the church any more than we choose our own families. We just sort of look around us and find that we're part of a gathering. Now I know you new members today have chosen to join this congregation. Nobody forced you to do this. But when you join, 
you will end up bound to us all. And if it had been up to you, would you have picked just this gathering of people? Probably not. Will you deeply connect with every person here? It's not likely. Will you agree with all of us on every topic? I don't think that's possible. Will we all succeed in treating each other with perfect Christian love? Certainly not. Will we fulfill every hope that you have? I'm pretty sure the answer there is also no. Because here's the thing, you're joining a community of people who are not so different from you. People who, like Adam and Eve, know something of what's good and what's evil, know what's right and what's wrong, but who still don't make the right choices all the time, who still get it wrong and who still find themselves hiding from time to time when God comes looking for us, maybe more often than we'd like to admit. Part of me wishes we could say something different, that we really could say you finally found the community where nothing goes wrong, where the sun always shines and people are always perfect and whole. But of course, you haven't found that group. What you found is the church. You found a group of people who are gathered around Jesus, around this one who promises freedom, who breaks down the boundaries that keep us apart, who accepts us as we are, and who offers himself in love. You found a group of people who rely on him, who trust in his grace, his forgiveness, and reconciliation when we get it wrong. You found a group of people who are seeking to do the will of God, to follow in Jesus' footsteps of breaking down the walls of hatred and fear, of setting captives free, of speaking words that empower and heal and renew. You found a group of people who are gathered by Christ and bound together, brothers and sisters in that great gift and that great task. We don't always get it right, but by God's grace, sometimes we do. And we are so glad you are here, Ludicia. We are so glad you are here, Liza and Charlotte, Claire and Maria and Daniel, Olga and Bethel and Marta. We are glad you are here as part of this gathering around Christ, this ever-widening circle, this sign of God's love for the whole world. Look around. Here are your brothers and your sisters. Thanks be to God. Amen.